Welcome some special guests. Let me read to you from Ephesians. Sometimes this is just a go-to passage for church. Ephesians 4. As a prisoner for the Lord then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over and through all and in all. And he goes on to say, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Aren't they great words? And that's what today is all about. It's meant to be encouragement. And uh, we're going to, we are firstly thankful for Chase and Amy and the family for coming down and Chase speaking to us in a minute and I'm going to drag him up here. But firstly there's someone else who would like to welcome you together today. G'day All Saints Nara. I'm thrilled to hear you've come out today to meet together around God's Word with Chase Coon uh, as you consider your year ahead in prayer uh, after such a tumultuous couple of years. It's great to know you're there meeting together. You're in my prayers. I'm encouraged that uh, Rusty and Cox has joined you in the ministry down there. I was thrilled to ordain him just last month or so and I certainly commend him to you. Uh, you may be a long way south, but you're not forgotten. Uh, I look forward to meeting you when I visit the Shoalhaven uh, later on in the year, around October I think. We're hoping uh, to hold a teaching morning with as many of the uh, Shoalhaven Anglican churches as are able to get together. But for now, have a great day together and uh, be assured that we pray for you, uh, we value your life and faith and hope and love and service uh, as you um, pursue the mission of Jesus uh, in uh, your beautiful uh, but challenging part of Australia. Have a great day. God bless you. Mm, how good is that? Our Heavenly Father, we, um, we do recognise that this is a beautiful part of Australia but also challenging. Uh, somewhat of a postcard, beautiful on one side but pretty basic on the other with people's lives and the mess and the need for Jesus. And we pray that even today that we would leave here with a greater sense of our mission to our region and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jace, why don't you come up and say hi. So, welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for coming. Really nice to see you. Yeah, and most people would have um, met Chase and Amy four years ago. I think we were calculating, it might yeah. be four years now. Oh my been, goodness. It feels like yesterday, but there's a lot that's happened since then. Yeah, so Chase has spoken at Big Day Inn and at our church camp at the end of the year, and um, you've agreed to do it all again. Yeah, I'm very glad to do it again. Yeah. Yeah, we had a great time with you all last time, well, the last few times we've been. Uh, so warmly welcomed by you. I um, remember especially a phenomenal morning tea that was uh, quite remarkable. My wife said, beeline it for the lemon, what was it, the lemon tart or something that we had last, uh, something that she said. Uh, you're bluffing. No, no I'm not bluffing. I'm dead serious about that. Uh, that was a conversation on the way down here actually this morning. All right. Um, but we're here for more than the baked goodies, I promise you that. Yeah, we're thank you. very glad to see you all. Yeah. Um, we've mentioned Amy, but there are children as well. Yes, we have four kids. Um, the best way to summarize our family would be probably a circus, I think. That's, uh, we have kids from 11 down to 1, and it's pretty much a party all the time. Excellent. Yeah. Um, now, for those who don't know, what's your day job? Yeah, uh, my, my job is a, a really privileged one. I get to teach people the Bible every day. So I, I work at Moore Theological College in Sydney. Uh, it's, a, it's a job that 
I never thought I would have and am very thankful to have. And uh, my work is to prepare men and women to serve in churches or ministries all over the globe. And so each day I get to teach them the Bible and, and how that applies to their life and their ministries. And mm-hmm. it's a real, real joy. And what's the Centre for Christian Living all about? Yeah. If you're involved in that. Ministry. I am, yeah. yeah. So um, Moore College has four centres that try to serve um, the wider world. And the one that I'm responsible for is called the Centre for Christian Living, which is an ethics centre, which sounds... Um, like we're really involved in just a lot of the kind of political debates that are around, which we do sometimes talk about. But really what we have a passion about is is when we read our Bibles and we see something to be true, the question is, if this is true, then what? Hmm. If, if this is what we believe, how do we live in response to that? And so, How should we then live? That's right. How should we then live? And so um, we want people to realize that ethics are involved in just our everyday decision making, uh, how we regard our neighbors, how we regard our family, how we make decisions, what kind of character we're trying to develop. And so the Center for Christian Living is helping people to think about how the Bible reaches them in everyday lives. Fantastic. All right, one last question. Please. It's the obvious one. Okay. When you can, what's your favorite pastime? (laughs) (laughs) Jeff Jeff and I have a mutual love of fishing. We do. Um, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know it about you either. Um, Although Jeff is uh, more handy around freshwater species with um, flies, and I tend to be out in the ocean. Um, But... We both like both kinds of fishing, don't we? So, yep, absolutely. Uh, we have a lot of fun fishing, yeah. So I, I like to fish. Much, but yeah, now, look, oh, sorry, there is one last question. Yeah, please. And that is, um, is that a new town accent that I'm picking up? Yeah, it is. Uh, I've just actually relocated out of Newtown. We've moved, um, we lived in Newtown for the better part of 10 years. Um, but we, li- we now live in Croydon Park in, in, in the inner west. Um, but uh, Amy and I were born in Los Angeles, raised around Los Angeles, grew up there, um, went to some of the surfing spots that Jeff knows um, in Huntington Beach. Uh, but then we lived in the American South before we moved to Australia in 2011. Mm-hmm. So we've been here since then. So my, my American accent, you wouldn't know it, but it feels like it's waning a little bit. It's it wearing is. down. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Well, that's a whole nother story. You're another, a long way from another home, long kids. story, yeah. Thank you for being here. Oh, we're so glad to be here, genuinely. You did go to the UK to study and write a book. Yeah, yeah, well, start a book. It's still in process. Yeah. Is it? Oh, yeah. okay. it's going to be a while, I think. Yeah. All right, we'll look for that. I've got four kids, Jeff. There's not a lot to get time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, at morning tea... Feel free to ask Chase about his encounter with a bear. Yeah, yeah, or a host of other wild animals if you want to hear about it. Yeah, yeah. the bear will do. That's a the nice bear's one. good one, yeah. All right. right. Thanks, Thanks, Chase. Jeff. Thank you. Um, sorry, would you excuse me for a moment? I've got to take this. Hello? Yeah? yeah. You, you want to come now? You know it's big day in, don't you? Okay, sure. Standing by. Hello. Hello. Hello there. Captain Elvanto. Oh, it's good to see you. Oh, let me tell you, oh, I've been travelling around cyberspace and oh, it's exhausting. Yeah, So sure. much metadata out there. Oh. What have you been up to? Uh, travelling through cyberspace, trying to sift through all the metadata. It's oh, so exhausting. Do you, know, you realise where you are? Take your glasses off, have a good look. You're at All Who Saints... Who are these people? All Saints Naura from each of our congregations. Ah, All Sorts Naura, the jewel in the crown of the Sydney Diocese. Yes, that's right. Ah, who's... Sorry, who's this handsome, tall gentleman with the clear-rimmed glasses over here? I, I think I've seen him before somewhere. Yeah, well, he's just a blow-in. Okay, but, um, yeah. He will yeah. be opening God's word to us a little later. Ah, now, why thanks. are you here? I am here on a mission, mm-hmm. a not-so-secret mission to help All Saints Naura. What with? Well, you see, 
As Captain Elvanto, I like to help churches mm. stay connected. I like to help God's people to stay connected with each other so they can encourage one another. And I also like to help God's people know when and how they can be serving at church. But that's not all. No. I like to help God's people know when things are happening at church. Mm. You might call it a calendar. Yes, we're familiar with calendars. But all, all in the one space in cyberspace. And what space is that, Captain Orvento? All on your phone at the touch of a button so that you and everyone in church can stay connected. Wow, can you help us with that, Captain Orvento? <laughs> I certainly can help you with that and I can help all of us stay connected. Well, okay, so what other superpowers do you have? Well, uh, Jeffrey, I can't let you in on all you, of my... Sorry, secrets. did you say Jeffrey? <laughs> Reverend Jeffrey? I can't let you in on all of my secrets. But there is one superpower I have that actually only All Saints has, and her name is Caitlin. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I believe she's here today, ready to help. Yes, so how's that going to work? How is it going to work? I've just come in You're from the side of the All right, well, I think that at morning tea, uh, if you have any questions, if you're having trouble with your Elvanto password or you don't even know what Elvanto is yet, then speak to Caitlin and she'll have an Elvanto help desk. So get your lemon tart slice and then head for Caitlin. Oh. I would love to stay for Lemon Slice, but I need to go into cyberspace to help more churches. Goodbye. Thank you, Captain Elvanto. <laughs> and he looks strangely familiar. I think that's Wallet Wizard. <laughs> Let's quieten our hearts and chase. Would you come and open God's Word? I don't know if I should be proud or ashamed that Rizzi was in class with me not just a year ago. I hope you can hear me, Rizzi. <laughs> I am very proud of him. Uh, that kind of thing would freak me out. I, I do not like... I can stand and preach, but it's the moment I have to start acting... Uh, it's all over. Now, if you would open your Bibles, please, to Psalm 145, I'd be grateful. Oh. Oops, you okay? Yep. Um. Sorry, what I've failed to announce is you would have got a welcome pack as you came in, and if you spill all those goodies out, you'll find that the cover also doubles as the outline for Great. Chase's talks. I'll speak more to those goodies in the pack a little later. Thank you. All right, Psalm 145. Um, it's actually my favourite psalm, and I was actually unaware of that last song that we sang uh, until this morning, which was a real pleasant surprise. What a delightful tune. And um, can I say, I visited quite a few churches. I'm not just putting this on, to, but you have a, a very... Uh, wonderful gift in your musicians here. Uh, it, is a, it is a real treat to, to, to be able to listen and join in singing here. It's a, it's a real blessing. Um, Psalm 145, open there please. I'm going to read there, but let me begin with prayer. Our Father, we are thankful that we get to be together this morning. Uh, I'm thankful to be here with the saints at uh, this church. And thank you, Lord, for the work that's happening here in Nara and indeed all over the globe. Today, Lord, we're praying that you would teach us from your word, give us good perspective about life and our place in it, about your care and provision, and about right expectations that we should have as your people living in this world. And as we listen to your word, as we find our understanding reframed. Would you lead us forward in faith, Lord? 
evermore trusting you and your goodness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what I'm hoping to talk to you about today is from two separate passages, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, looking at God's goodness and our experience in the world. And what I hope you'll see just in in those two things is that many of us know God to be good, proclaim God to be good, and yet at times in our experience don't always feel that God is good. Now, I hope you do. I hope you, I hope you just say, no, that's not even an issue for me. But for many of us, I suspect, it is an issue. And even the, the very reasons I haven't been able to visit for the last couple of years, even after kind uh, invitations from Jeff, um, is because of many sh- struggles that we've all been going through. And so today, I hope, as we hear God's Word, we'll have a better understanding of our place in this world, of God's care for his world, and right expectations that we can have as people. Let's begin with Psalm 145. I'm going to read the whole psalm. I'd ask you to follow along. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds. And I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all of his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up All who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways, and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Well, as I said, that's my favorite psalm, I think, at least today it is. There's something to be said about tradition. Many of us hold traditions, but the Jewish people used to recite this psalm three times a day. Now you listen to it and you think that's quite a lot to read or remember. But they used to say it three times a day. And this tradition was really intended to orient them to a particular frame for reality. And this is it. God is worthy of praise. God is worthy of praise constantly and forever. And the reminder of this truth is something that I assume is helpful to all of us, at least if you're like me. We know what it's like for the worries and the demands of life. 
to creep in and to crowd out that most important work of us remembering the Lord. For me, it's very easy for me to slip out of the right frame of mind with just the most minute changes to my circumstances. I think about something as simple as a holiday. A holiday upsets your rhythms in wonderful ways, but also in ways where I just get out of sync in my normal prayer time or my normal Bible reading time. And if too much time goes by like that, it's very easy for me to feel quite distant from God because I'm out of these rhythms. But of course it gets much worse when something like tragedy comes upon us. Maybe your loved one is lost. Maybe you've become very ill. Or a pandemic upsets the whole globe. It's in these moments that I think the wisdom of traditions like these become quite apparent to us. Questions come to us. Who provides for the world? Who has power to control all circumstances? Who can give what we need in our times of most profound desperation? The answer in Psalm 145 is that the Lord, the King, provides for all creation. The psalm, I think, gives us a reality check. It helps us to remember the most fundamental thing about our existence, and that is that we are dependent people. We all depend on the Lord. In fact, all humanity, all creation, depends upon the Lord. So today I'd like to look at this psalm in three parts, and I'm hoping that it will offer you and me both helpful words for times and circumstances that we live in. Times maybe of great crisis for you, maybe personal crises that, I mean, I, I don't know most of you, but maybe you need that just, that check on your time and space in this life. To remember that it's the Lord who continues to care for you and provide for you. The Lord continues to engage the world that he's made. And in the end, I'm hoping that all of us will have hearts that overflow with praise because the Lord is so good and provides so wonderfully. So the first thing I want us to see is this. The Lord's greatness is unsearchable. Worthy of eternal and unending praise. The Lord's greatness is unsearchable. Worthy of eternal and unending praise. If we are tempted to turn away from praise, it's often because we think from our circumstances outwards. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I know. This is what I've been experiencing. And we begin almost to think towards God from that position. We try to make sense of God from our experience. But notice that David, the author of this psalm, does the opposite. David starts with truth about God and then thinks about how that impacts his experiences. Now that's a really important corrective for all of us. If we just begin with our circumstances, we're going to distort truth about God. But if we think about God first we find real help in our circumstances. And so repetition of a psalm like this can be helpful because it reminds us of truth amid our circumstances. Notice how we're instantly swept up into a chorus of praise in this psalm. In fact, I think this is the only psalm that has praise in the title. David begins with an exclamation that he will extol, he will bless, he will praise God. And then we often think about praise being something quite spontaneous. Something good happens to me. Woo, thank you, Lord. Uh, that's a great thing to do, by the way. David is very calculated here. David has written an artful masterpiece. This beautiful poem, beginning with every letter of the alphabet. He's working down, just thinking in a very premeditated way about wonderful truths. And we shouldn't miss these early words that David recognizes his right place under my God and King. He is the King, David the King, but he is under God as his King. 
So like a loyal servant would take a knee and kiss the hand of a king and pledge allegiance, here David the king is humbling himself before God. And he says that his praise will be every day and forever. Look at verse 4 and see that David says he's simply joining the chorus line. Generation after generation has been and will continue to declare the Lord's praises. And what are the truths that are so praiseworthy about God? Well, David gives us at least three here in these first seven verses. You see in verse, uh, first of all, that the Lord is mighty in verse four. Generations shall declare your mighty acts, we're told. And again in verse six, they shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds. This tells us that the Lord is a God who acts in history. And he does so with power. More and more, I think that we doubt that God works in history. I think we find this is a real challenge. I mean, really, does God actually do things? Did he really perform these deeds? I think what's happened um, is that we've told stories about God and just thought of them simply as sort of children's tales. But I think we need to correct that. We need to remember that the reason why we're telling our children these stories is to help them see the way that God has worked in the past. That these Sunday school lessons are not just children's fables and myths, but they're actually part of history. They give us a frame for reality. We tell them because we say, this is our God. These are actual acts of power that he has done. He really did part a sea. He really did deliver people from slavery. He really did call down fire on false prophets. He really did send his son. So, we remember that God has worked. Second, beyond his mighty works, we look in verse 5 and it tells us that the Lord is majestic. It's upon the Lord's majesty that David takes pause to reflect. And it's difficult to capture beauty when we can't see something and behold it with our eyes. But remember that the world, the whole world is the theater of God's glory. I'm, I'm very, very thankful. I'm staying at Hans Beach this weekend, which is... One of the most beautiful places in the world, isn't it? I'm staying there because I have a friend that has a house that's generously let me stay there. No, we were coming down. And as majestic as that scene is in that, you know, sugar white sand. I mean, I was sitting this morning just in the rain looking out just on the, the bush behind the house. Vivid green. Gorgeous and lush. And you think this whole world is the canvas on which God is displaying his majesty. But not just that, not just the the beautiful pictures we see, but the kinds of relationships that God keeps with the world, the ways he keeps interacting with us and loving us and providing for us. And this feeds into our next final notice for praise, that the Lord is good. Look at verse 7. It says, They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, And sing aloud of your righteousness. Just as we doubt God's power and we fail to see his beauty, I suspect many of us here question God's goodness. And his goodness is what makes him majestic. One of the great wonders of life captured a bit later on in this psalm is that God acts consistently towards all. He is always good to all. And so when we experience suffering, tragedy, or evil, it seems very difficult for us to believe that God is good. But a faith first position, like David's, helps us to praise even through those tough times. God is good. We we declare that. We believe it. We see it. And if I believe first that God is good, then whatever I'm encountering in my life can be seen through that lens. But if I start with my circumstances, it's very easy for me to question. God is good. In fact, Romans 8 tells us 
that in every circumstance, God has purposed it for the good of those who love him. And so when you think about praise in your own life, I wonder if yours is a bit like mine, fairly intermittent. Uh, If something really great happens on my good days, I remember to say, oh, thank you, Lord. What a great gift from you. But sometimes it really is pretty half-hearted for me. Half-baked. What David is modeling to us here is an appropriate attunement to praise of God. He's watching out for it, ever observing, ever praising God for his acts and his character. I often admire the likes of of someone like Jonathan Edwards, who was America's greatest theologian uh, back in the 18th century. And he used to ride around on horseback and preach about Jesus. And inside of his coat, he had these little fasteners. I'm not going to show you the inside of my shirt, but he, uh, he had these little fasteners with bits of paper. And as he'd be riding on horseback, he'd just start penciling down notes, taking observations of God's wonder, of praise, points that he could reflect on and meditate on constantly. I think that these opportunities like Edward seized are just little windows into the goodness of God. But this sort of observation for God's goodness isn't a treasure hunt like we often assume it is. It's not like we have to go digging to try to find something. It's actually all around us. And so what we should have is a disposition to praise. We should be attuned to praising God for anything and everything around us. And looking out on our world with eyes of faith, we should recognize like David, my God and my King, constantly at work and live in reverent worship of Him because His greatness is unsearchable and He is worthy of incessant and eternal praise. This leads us to our second section in the psalm. David tells us that the Lord's eternal reign can be seen in both a covenantal and a common rule. Now that sounds really technical, but let me tell you what I mean. God reigns over his people, his covenant people, and God reigns over all. And we begin to see a split, if you will, of how God provides especially for his people and commonly for the whole world. This is in verses 8 to 13. So the Lord does reign over everything and everyone, but he keeps a close relationship, especially with his people. So verses 8 and 9 set the stage for this section. Look with me at verses 8 and 9. Verse 8, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. This comes from Exodus 34, when Moses asks to see God's glory, and God says, I'm going to hide you in the rock, you can't see me and live, I'll pass by, and the Lord proclaims his name. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This gets featured time and again throughout the scriptures, but here again, we hear this repeated, this is who Yahweh is, the covenant God of Israel. One writer calls this the most satisfactory description of God's nature given anywhere. Isn't that lovely? If you want to know what God is like, there you go. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That's a, that's a pretty wonderful description. This is a declaration of how God relates to his people especially. It's the Lord who is near to a people that he's redeemed and brought into a gracious relationship with himself. But then look at verse 9 and see a depiction of God's common care. The Lord, we're still talking about him and his character, the Lord is good to all. And his mercy is over all that he has made. Those two statements are consistent, but apply to different audiences, aren't they? Though all people do not know God's salvation, his character is unchanging. He's good, and he's merciful unto the whole. He's not just kind to his own people, but to the whole world. 
It's just like Jesus says in Matthew 5. I understand you've been going through the Summer on the Mount. By the way, not just good music, but look at these graphics. That's, that's no joke. That's impressive. Um, Matthew 5, Jesus says that God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. And in other words, God is indiscriminate in his common care for the world. There is a basic provision and sustenance that the Lord continues to afford people whether they recognize him or not. In time, at least for now, as we'll see in just a few moments. These verses lead into a response of the creation to God in verses 10 to 13. The whole creation will give thanks to God because of his good rule and provision. But in particular, and in the most intimate sense, the saints, that is the covenant people of God, they will bless him and make his glory known to the whole of humanity. So that the praise of the saints, in one sense, serve a missional purpose here. The creation knows and appreciates generally, but the saints know precisely. So while the whole world benefits, we know God intimately. And we can say, we know exactly where this is coming from. The glory of God's eternal kingdom is something we will proclaim because the king is over all forever. Now, if I'm honest, I think we've become a little bit embarrassed about giving recognition to God. I think especially in public. We thank him for things like salvation, but I think we neglect praise when it becomes just more general and mundane things. So, simple question. Who gives you food? Or when your paycheck clears, where does it come from? Well, we'd be foolish to leave our answers to natural causes. Food comes from the ground or the shops. My paycheck comes from my hard work. Well, of course these are factual statements, but they're incomplete. Because while food does come from the ground or from the shops, it's the Lord who's provided. While my paycheck comes from my hard work, it's the Lord who's provided. The Lord is the giver of every good gift. And so when we pause to thank God for something like a meal when we're sitting down, we're doing more than just going through the motions. We're actually giving appropriate credit to our great provider. And even those prayers before food, they're the right kind of interruptions to get us to remember, oh yes, Lord, here's yet again another sign of your goodness to us. Yes, Lord, thank you. And this ties straight into our final section of the psalm. This picks up in verse 13 down to the end in verse 20. I know there's 21. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Satisfying provision for all. Satisfaction, right? Satisfying provision for all. The Lord's provision is faultless. I think I've changed the title from what I sent through to Jeff. It's irreproachable in your notes, probably. I just try to go over something a bit clearer, maybe. It's faultless, irreproachable, faultless. We see in these final verses an explanation and an an opening up, if you will, of what's already been shown of the Lord's relationship to both his creation and his special people. First, he relates caringly to all of his creation in verses 14 to 16. Look with me. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food in their due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Again, the Lord is indiscriminate. He provides wondrously for his whole creation. Every creature satisfying a particular desire. There is no living being that is cut off from his generous hand. He provides for and sustains the world. But second, look at verses 18 and 19 with me. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. 
you see the nearer relationship that God keeps to His covenant people. The Lord hears all who call on Him and the ones that know Him in truth. What distinguishes the whole creation from God's people is that His people know Him in truth. So the creation doesn't even know that it looks up to God for Him to open His hand and provide for them, but we know. We know. There's a difference there about knowing. We know the fact that God provides for all, that He alone reigns over all, and it's Him alone who can save. And so while there is a a temporary satisfaction that's given, just in the basic supply of life to all creation, there is a deeper, eternal satisfaction for all of us who are redeemed. Because we know God intimately. And amid these verses, there's a declaration of God's character in verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways and kind in all of his works. He is faultless. In some ways, I think we wouldn't need to be told this after everything we've read in this psalm. But too often, I think we lose sight of our of reality in the midst of our circumstances. So many have received from God day in and day out, and they continue to receive their life and their breath and their very being. And yet, as the circumstances of the world around us change and need is found, people immediately cry foul. How could you, God? Why would you, God, Where are you, God? This psalm locates us into a much bigger frame of reality. It reminds us of how the world works. It reminds us of who truly cares. There is no reality without God. There is no life without God. Every day is a gift that He gives. And every season He continues to uphold the world in His divine mercy and forbearance. And so when we encounter calamity like a pandemic or personal loss that we may face, we're not facing an absent God, but we're facing the ramifications of of sin and a cursed world. And in the middle of our suffering and loss, we can continue to see God's gracious care and provision even in the midst of those trials. And this leads to the final piece of the psalm in verse 20. The Lord preserves all who love Him, but all the wicked He will destroy. It's a very sobering word. God's people will be kept because they know and they love the King. That is, by His mercy, they have found favor and He will deliver them. But the wicked, even though they've enjoyed and even been satisfied in this life temporarily, they will face an eternal death. This message is so similar to what Paul delivered in Athens in a passage in Acts chapter 17. He told them that All this time, they had been worshipping lesser gods. They had been moving through, he'd moved through the the temple that they had of all these different idols and even found the altar to an unknown god. And he's trying to say, you've been worshipping unknown gods, but this unknown deity that you've left marked for worship, Paul makes known to them. And he says, there's actually only one god who's made everything. And in Him we live and move and have our being. And He gives them a very firm warning. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent because He's fixed a day on which He'll judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. And of this He's given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. This brings to the conclusion, the finale. Praise Him. The psalm concludes with the depiction of King David continuing in praise. 
and with a charge to us, let all flesh bless His holy name forever and ever. This is a very real command. It's a command for every single person, every single being, every single beast even, I think. Praise God. Praise God because He is the provider of all. It's kind of like Psalm 2 which says, Kiss the Son. Give your allegiance to Him because one day at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is but one King and He must be honored. The command in so many ways is unnecessary. Praise Him. Do we need to be told that? Praise Him. We've seen such a rich depiction of God's character and His actions on display in this psalm, and yet, every day, the world goes round and round, receiving from God's good hand and totally ignoring the God that's giving to them. Far be it from us. Far be it from us, the ones who know the Lord so intimately, even with His Spirit in our hearts, to neglect to give the Lord the praise that He is owed. So, returning to tradition, it may seem very legalistic to stop and say this kind of a psalm three times a day, or to pray before a meal. But perhaps it's this kind of tradition that we need for a constant reminder to lift our hearts to the Lord. Now in the next session, I'm going to take you into some of Jesus' teaching, not uh, the Sermon on the Mount, but the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. And we're going to get, hopefully, clearer expectations about what it means for us to live in this world as God's people and setting our expectations aright. We've got a grand view just now of God's rule over everything, and now we're going to talk about our experience of living in that world in the next session. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for Your goodness. It is unsearchable and faultless, and You are deserving of all praise. Would You pray, Lord, that You would fill our hearts with appropriate thankfulness. We pray that our confession of who You are and even the memory of how you've acted would serve as an anchor for us in the midst of our experiences. That we would be faith-first people thinking about your goodness to us even when we find ourselves in trying circumstances. And in doing so, Lord, we pray we'll continue to offer you the praise that you are most worthy of. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, all saints. Welcome to our house. Hope you're having a good big day in. We thought you'd bring we thought we'd bring you into our house. So here we are. Here's the kids. Do you want to say hi, kids? Hi. Oh, there, right, there we are. Ellie's just reading a book. Oscar's watching his favourite football team. Yeah. So um. We thought we'd just give you an update on what we're doing. I've been working with some teams in India. This last week I've been checking Genesis with a team and in the coming week I'll be checking Mark with some teams. Um, <laughs> here's where I usually sit and work. There's my little nook. And I'm continuing to work on a project management at Rev79 that connects Bible translators and resources around the world. And I work over the road at the Baptist Church. Um, it's a very long commute. So I, I, I walk about two minutes, that one minute that way to the Baptist yeah. Church yeah. over the road. And, um, and I've got uh, space in their hall and I have two team members that come in and work with me some days. And as a hobby, I like to work in the garden out here. Okay. So, thanks for partnering with us. And um, we really appreciate your partnership and in bringing the Bible to many people in India and across the world. So, thank you. Have a great day. Hey, everyone at All Saints. Uh, this is just a quick hello. Um, 
uh, for you on your big day in. Uh, I'm praying that it's encouraging and a, a great step into the new year and all that God is doing there and through you. I pray that it's uh, encouraging for you today. Um, I wanted to say a big thank you for your partnership with me over the last few years. Um, I'm currently back in Australia on home assignment. Uh, I've been here since November and uh, I'll be here for a little while longer. Uh, The time uh, in the last few months have been a really good rest and rejuvenation. Uh, God has been kind to give me some uh, time to do that. The last term in Southeast Asia was a really challenging one. Um, So thank you for your continued and faithful prayer for me during that time and uh, for those that I was living amongst and with and ministering to and with in Southeast Asia. I'd love it if you would keep praying uh, for me during this time of visiting different linked churches. Um, I'll be with you in June. I'm really looking forward to uh, meeting once again and sharing all that God has done. I'd love to uh, join you in your grow group or spend some time with you. Uh, So keep that in mind uh, for the week that I'm down there visiting. Uh, Thank you so much again for your partnership. Uh, It's really valuable and I really couldn't do uh, what I'm doing in Southeast Asia without you. Um, God bless you and see you soon. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Greetings, uh, all saints now run. Uh, We are so thankful for your gospel partnership. Uh, This is the Masangos. Uh, we are living here in the city of Blauwe, Zimbabwe, where we are serving with students, uh, university students under SIM Zimbabwe, uh, working also with a small church plant just outside the university called Living Hope Church. Um, yeah, we're grateful for your constant prayers um, and uh, your encouragement uh, in so many ways. Um, should we introduce the kids uh, briefly? All right, so this is Amasle, the newest member of the family. She's uh, just uh, five and a half months old now. This is Onati, the eldest. As you can see, she's in a school uniform, about to dress off to school. She just started grade one, which is like year one in Australia. And this is Sunny Le, whom you've all been praying for. He's also about to leave for free school this morning. And he's two and a half, turning three in July. Yeah, so thank you for your prayers. So we um, we've just opened again at university and students are coming back. And we are grateful for the many opportunities we have there to disciple students, to evangelize students. And we have also recently started training up um, uh, gospel workers uh, for the future through our transmission apprenticeship program, which started uh, just a month ago. Uh, thank you for your prayers, and uh, we pray that God will be blessing you as you serve uh, him uh, in Naura. Part of who you are as all saints is partners in who they are and their ministry around the globe and don't they do extraordinary things? This is, uh, this is not really a, a Bible teaching moment um, so please indulge me as your pastor as uh, one who has um, been charged with leading you over the last couple of years. The last couple of years have damaged the Western Church. I spoke recently with an archdeacon in Melbourne responsible for several city churches and he said they've closed two and another one will go into receivership. Only 20% of their congregations are back. The question of return to normal church is being discussed by Christian leaders and commentators all around the world. Yet disruption to normal has always been the backdrop of Jesus' church. And strangely, the flourishing of his church for over 2,000 years when normal has been interrupted. Let's not forget for the first 300 years of Christianity, normal was to be persecuted. In AD 64, Christianity was declared religio illicita the unlawful religion and terrible persecutions drove the church underground. Um, There were brief intervals of peace in that time but then it would resume to normal to be persecution and worse than before and so on throughout history and across the world. Under this stress 
this normal stress. Jesus' church had the habit of growing because believers cared for one another and the community around them. Perhaps for the last 200 years for Christianity in the West has not been normal, it's been abnormal. The challenge for the Western Church during COVID is that COVID came when we were at our lowest, when our immunity was at our lowest, and not our physical immunity, but when infection by consumerism and individualism was at its highest in the church. Does that make sense? Consumerism and individualism. I want to read to you from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Verse 4, those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. Imagine the apostles uh, running, um, running their first church attendance and conversion through uh, El Vanto holding the first, I don't know, church growth conference, satisfied with how things were going, new church plants were happening everywhere, and suddenly the the people's favourite deacon, Stephen, was martyred and the whole church scattered. First one. And a man called Saul is wreaking havoc And he began to destroy the church. I opened by saying the last couple of years have damaged the Western church. Here in this story, Saul is destroying the church. Normality, normal was the first casualty. But God was working through it. And his plans enfolded Saul to take the gospel out even further into the world And I just can't help believing that God in 2020 and so on knew that his church needed a shakedown. It wasn't directly persecution, but it was costly to us. Perhaps in that sense we went through a scattering or more to the point, a pruning. The gardener was pruning his church. Yeah. And now in 2022, only a crazy pastor would say, that's behind us, we're all returning to normal now. It may be that 2022 is a time of some normalising, but then again, new strains and outbreaks always seem around the corner, don't they? More disruption. Who will you be if this is the new normal and um, Chase has just given us the big picture. Truth about God should reframe our circumstances. Brothers and sisters, let's not get addicted to normal ever again. Let's not allow normal to dictate who we are as believers as we live out our calling to be the church people who gather Sunday by Sunday to sing spiritual songs to encourage one another to pray and come before God's word and to express the life of Jesus together in Christian community. Yes, be wise about coming to church if you are immunocompromised but don't live in fear of COVID. Since the birth of the church Christians have not feared death. Peter writes, do not fear what they fear. 1 Peter 3, 14. Isn't that a call out? 
gather with God's people when you're able, no matter what normal looks like. Being present with other believers is one of the most important things we do. Huddling in our homes watching footy and Netflix is not. So have a kingdom perspective. Be wise, but have a kingdom perspective. Whatever comes next. And I want to say as a pastor, and I'm sure uh, along with every spiritual leader in this church, thank you. Thank you for meeting together in grow groups and for prayer across the very relationally challenged Zoom during lockdowns, for contacting and spurring on one another. Thank you for faithfully switching on your TV and devices to our, our YouTube services, especially when they were clunky and always less than what church was meant to be. You could have turned on your TVs, perhaps you did, to uh, the big church TV stations. But it's so important to belong to a church family and to allow the word of God to come through that context firstly. And uh, let me tell you, as great as John Piper and Tim Keller are, they will not visit you or conduct your funeral. Thank you for maintaining giving so that when we emerged from these COVID lockdowns, we were in good shape financially. Thank you for coming back to church so quickly, even suffocating in masks. (laughs) I'd like to say you are amazing. But Jesus has a different word for it, faithful. And isn't that the word, the one word we want to hear when we stand before him? Welcome, good and faithful servants. So what of this year? Well, uh, we are trying to reimagine normal again, aren't we? In the sense of picking up from exactly where we were, we're exactly where we left off two years ago here at Big Day Inn when Peter Merrick spoke to us. Do you remember what happened? Very next day, lockdown. Wow. We, we pitched a whole bunch of things that we were revving up to do and Suddenly they were snatched away from us. As you may recall, we were about to launch uh, a regional mission together and suddenly all our plans were cancelled. All our evangelistic events. And it's true, our compassion ministries like uh, All Saints Community Care and Mobile Community Pantry and Open House persevered looking outwardly to the community over those years. But in truth, we as a church had to look inwardly, pastorally together and we haven't done a lot of outreach and evangelism over those years. Caring for the church was a big call. But it's time to face outwardly again, surely, evangelistically, carrying the word boldly to our community and I'm not even sure what that looks like yet. But I think it is a new season to speak actively our gospel of hope in Jesus. Now the other side of normalising, if we dare to use that word, is serving together. And Rusdian will say more about this, but it does take a whole church to be the church. I know that's a variation on a, a famous saying, but even when you consider Sunday services, sometimes it takes 40 to 50 people to pull off Sunday. That's a lot of people serving in a church our size. And musicians and Bible readers and prayer, prayers and sound desk and data and children's program, welcoming. And then there's children and youth ministries that are in dire need of leaders and helpers midweek. And our compassion ministries, um, even things like mowing the lawn. Thank you, Laninia. It's just been a crazy, lawn mowing summer. Our technology, our setup, we need to come back and serve. Um, All serving is missional because together as a body 
you had a phrase, we praise God because it declares who God is to the wider community. That's who we are when we do everything together to be this church in praise. We need people to come back and serve. Uh, and of course there is giving, which isn't a taboo subject around here. I'll speak to that a little later and let you know what our budget is, uh, our, our giving target is for the year. Please continue to give. And we are, I'll just say it, we're about $20,000 behind year to date. That means from January to March. We've got to do a little bit of catching up. Continue to give faithfully. So here's what I'm, uh, I'm reimagining for 2022. I want to imagine a people who have a renewed appreciation for what we may have taken for granted as church together in the past, who have so tasted the loss of lockdown, the loss of not meeting together, the loss of connection, so much so that they are hungry to make the most of every moment, make the most of every day because the days are evil. I don't imagine a people who gather together each Sunday like it's the highlight of the week, like it's the highest priority and to model that to our kids. I want to imagine people who want to build into this church to express the intentional life shared together, which we may not have intentionally prioritised before. To sacrifice and seize every opportunity to be salt and light in this town. Salt that preserves the saving gospel held out and a community of light so bright that the sales of sunglasses in this town are inexplicably going through the roof. Salt and light community. We've been thinking about that in Matthew. Uh, I want to reimagine a new normal of a church that has been given such a wake-up call to how fragile freedom of faith really is how easy it is for a pandemic or the growing forces of darkness to snatch away the freedom to worship and to proclaim the gospel in our schools and how fleeting peace in the world is as the Ukraine has recently discovered. The days are dark and they are short. I'm imagining a people who are very conscious of that. And so I can't help but reimagine a people who therefore want to grow in the word and maturity in Christ, to be alert and in the discipline of prayer together. Um, Reimagining the new normal is about heeding the warning not to forget which is the word to God's people in Deuteronomy, not to forget but to remember that everything we enjoy is from God's hand and for his glory. In the new normal, no ministry has to beg for volunteers. In the new normal, Catherine has people lining up and turning them away who want to teach scripture while we still have it in our schools. In the new normal, we invite our friends to church and people are saved when they hear the gospel. In the new normal, our monthly prayer meeting is full. Is it wishful thinking? Or is it reasonable to imagine we emerge from this pandemic different, hungrier, And I'm also uncomfortably imagining more conflicts as we get closer together and more passionate about the challenge of the gospel in every area of our life, particularly holiness. But I'm heartened because where there is 
conflict and authentic Christian living, there is also a culture of peace that flourishes and a practice of deep forgiveness and generosity. I am imagining another kind of uncomfortable and that is that we outgrow our services and we need to plant more. And I can imagine that maybe some this morning are thinking, sounds like rhetoric to me. Just sounds like pumping up our tyres. How can you imagine, Jeff, anything like that when we're barely crawling out of our caves and coming together again? Well, the reason I want to reimagine Jesus' church differently here is because I do believe he has been sifting and pruning his church for what? For new growth. For numbers? Not necessarily. But for a deeper walk with Jesus. Growth in maturity. Pruning brings new growth. And whatever this year brings, I'm imagining a people who don't look back sentimentally in the rear vision mirror for three years ago, the old normal. I'm imagining a people who don't want to look back or go back for anything because of the toxic consumerism and complacency and individualism that we were perhaps caught up in and addicted to. And because Jesus is using whatever shape this new normal is, to take us to a better and deeper place together. Two scriptures to finish with. One comes from uh, Ephesians 5, 15 to 21. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Big call, isn't it? Big reimagining. And this from 1 Peter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to obtain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. What we're going to do right now is break up into some little prayer huddles. And this, you may think there's no room to do that, but this is what people, Christians, do in conferences all around the world. Where they're sitting, find two, three, six, turn around and form a little group and pray for the next few minutes. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what to pray because you're the church and you know who you are together and what our needs are. I've been banging on about those for some time. Pray for one another. Would you do that for a few minutes?
I confess, I heard temptation knock at my door. 
that was hardly in disguise. Even so, I did not ask it to leave. I stepped aside, invited it in, and entertained it for a while. Like the old companion it used to be. But soon I remembered my Savior resisted the devil at his weakest moment when the devil twisted the words of Scripture and offered him a way out of suffering. Jesus said, Flee. How could I even open the door and look it in the eye? Forgive me, Lord. You are my shelter. You are my rest. You alone are my refuge and place of safety. Who else can I trust? You are my God and I will trust in you. You alone are my refuge. Amen. to sit back down because we're going to morning tea and the instruction is really graze and be thankful. You don't have to pay for our barista coffee but you know what, it'd be nice if you could kick the tin a little bit because it all finds its way back into our giving budget and how we spend it on mission.
So, you reminded us, Chase, that to say grace and to be thankful at lots of little intervals is so important. So let's make that the little interruption now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the food we're about to eat. But mostly, Father, we thank you for the food of your word which came to us this morning in Psalm 145. Teach us to be grateful to you who are worthy of all praise. Amen. And if you're holding back your lunch money and don't know what to do with it, do not bombard Caitlin now. Uh, you can do that at lunchtime and, um, and, 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 and the, moment, the thing that I was going to tell you was please bombard Caitlin if you want to know more about Elvanto. Thanks everyone. See you back in, in, at 11 o'clock. <laughs>